the most important event in the book of Acts was definitely the arrival of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. The second most important, well, you could really argue, was Saul's conversion. Luke devotes chapters 13 to 18 and beyond to Paul. That's a good chunk of the book. Thirteen of the 27 books of the New Testament were written by Paul, who was once Saul. Saul, who when we pick up in Acts chapter 9, it says, Meanwhile, Acts chapter 9, verse 1. Meanwhile, so it's referring to chapter 8, where we had the mass evangelism, the public evangelism of Philip and Peter and John, and then the personal evangelism of Philip with the Ethiopian eunuch. Chapter 9 picks up, meanwhile, what's Saul doing? He is still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. Now I'm curious if you have different versions. What does that first sentence of Acts chapter 9 say in the King James Version, Betty? What does it say there? Okay, so breathing out murderous and threatening insults. Bill, what does your Bible say? Verse 1 of Acts chapter 9, what does it say? Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. Uttering threats with every breath. That's probably the best translation from the Greek. Because the word used literally means breathing in. But it may be best interpreted just breathing. He's so upset with these Christians, these people of the way, that he's just breathing hate. Threats. And it says, meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. So he went to the high priest and asked him for letters to synagogues in Damascus. So that if he found anyone there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. Now, what's so important about Damascus? Damascus is still around today, one of the few ancient cities that still on the map, even still in the news. It's located in Syria. And back in those days, it was a main trading city, kind of linked everybody to all the trading routes. So when they come up from Egypt to travel to Mesopotamia, they would stop in Damascus. And there was a good concentration of Jews in Damascus. And the disciples have been dispersed. There's a good chance there's a good number of these Christians who need to be brought back and punished to Jerusalem. So consider this. <clears throat> Paul, he is so adamant, so vicious in this pursuit of these Christians He's going to travel 150 miles to get him. 150 miles on foot. Jews, they really didn't use horses that much. That was more of a Roman thing. So he'd be traveling on foot. It would take about six days. He's on his way. He's serious about his business. 
verse 3. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. Something that tells me that that light was like no earthly light. A light from heaven. And I like when we read about heaven in the Bible. Evidence of a reality that really exists. That's what reality is, right? But I like how Jesus put that in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Heaven exists. It's a real place. That's something to get excited about. Well, yeah, it does almost sound like he's struck by lightning. But you think back, think back to the transfiguration, how Jesus' clothes were as bright as lightning. And he shone like lightning. Or his clothes was whiter than any bleach than anybody could ever bleach something white. Yeah, lightning was... Probably. Uh, verse 4. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? All right. I will give you $5 and a trip to the 7-Eleven if you can tell me the Greek word for voice there in verse 4. I'm going to give you a hint, but if you get it with the hint, you don't get the five bucks. You have one in your pocket or on your person. Not cell, phone. <laughs> Phone. That's what the word for voice right there in verse 4. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul clearly knew he was talking to somebody in authority, someone who had some kind of power. Let's hear from different versions. Betty, let's start with you again. What does Paul ask in verse 5? Um, and he said, well, he said, There's something to think about there. When anybody does something to persecute the church, physically, verbally, who are they really persecuting? Jesus, God, the head of the church. Hmm. And it's never good when you kick against that, is it? Oh, hey, if you have not seen the movie, Places in the Heart, starring Sally Field. It was on Turner Classic Movies last night. Excellent movie. Not a cuss word in it, nice and clean. But it's about a woman whose husband dies during the Depression in Texas. To make a long story short, a guy, a black guy, comes to find work. She hires him, convinces him to plant cotton. And he warns her before they pick the cotton what's going to happen. It's not thorns, but something prickly like it. And her hands got all tore up, all of them tore up. Because you don't want to kick against that stuff or pick against that stuff. Even in the movie, their knees were all scratched up from. It is a very good movie. Places in the heart. 
It's a story about forgiveness and grace. Yeah. So who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but they did not see anyone. This is a Bible study, so let's go to John chapter 12. Because something very similar happens in John chapter 12. In this case, Saul heard the voice of Jesus. But the others just heard a sound. Something very similar happened in John chapter 12 verse 20. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the feast. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth. Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now, my heart is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No. It was for this very reason that I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then, a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to them. Jesus said, This voice was for your benefit, not mine. So some heard the voice. Some understood. Some didn't. And what happened with the Jesus encounter in Acts chapter 9? Saul saw the light, heard the voice. The others heard the sound but didn't understand it. They didn't describe it as thunder or anything, but a very similar experience to John 12. Verse 8, Acts chapter 9. Saul got up from the ground. But when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus... There is a man named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. Bill, what does your Bible say in verse 10? And how did Ananias respond? Yes, Lord, he replied. Okay. How about the King James Version? How does Ananias reply there? Behold, I am here, Lord. Behold, I am here. That reminded me of Isaiah's God encounter 
in Isaiah chapter 6. When the angel of the Lord was like, who am I going to send? And he didn't say, I am here. He said, here I am. It's just interesting when you have these God encounters, how people respond. Ananias responded very similar to Isaiah. Here I am. I am here. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street. So far, pretty easy direction. Anyone here ever been to Pittsburgh? Ever try to drive in the city of Pittsburgh? Lots of one-way streets. Yes, you can see it, but it's kind of tricky. Damascus, I guess, I've never been there, is very similar. Except Straight Street. There's one, to this day, very long straight street. It's believed to be the same straight street that we read about in Acts chapter 9. So, easy for Ananias to get there. Sure, I can go to straight street. Easy. The request gets much harder after that. And ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias and places hands on him and restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm that he has done to your holy people. Other translations say to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. Makes you wonder if there were some spies on the inside. Believers who knew that Saul came to Caiaphas most likely, the high priest. How otherwise would Ananias have known that Saul had letters or permission and authority from the high priest to arrest people? Maybe. May have been just the reputation. Word of mouth, travel 150 miles. Point is, Ananias knew who Saul was. That's kind of a scary request. Hey, Barry. Would you minister to the number one terrorist in Afghanistan? Someone who you know is out to harm you. When well, we talked about it last week, to wreak havoc. Havoc like a wild boar to wreak on a human body. Or the mess they'd make and destroy in their prey. I've heard reports, many reports about this man and all the harm he's done to your holy people in Jerusalem. Verse 14. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest you, arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go. This man is my chosen instrument. That word reminded me of this past Sunday's message when Dustin was talking about how we are chosen and destined. He's my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. So this prophecy that God has given to Ananias about Saul proclaiming the name of Jesus to the Jews and the Gentiles happens in Acts chapter 22 and Acts chapter 26. Paul is arrested, brought before crowds of people. What does he do? He tells the story we're reading now. The story of his conversion. Verse 16. 
I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, let's stop there. What did he just call the terrorist who's out to get all the Christians? Brother. That's quite a gracious greeting, isn't it? Well, do you know what Ananias means? You know what that name means? The Lord is gracious. He's living up to his name. The kind of people Saul came to persecute is there bringing comfort and healing to Saul. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, if Saul wasn't convinced already, (laughs) how did this dude, Ananias, know my name, (laughs) know to come here, and know that Jesus encountered me? It's got to be real. Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. God, I'm going to test your reading comprehension. How long has it been since he had something to eat or drink? Three days, very good. So what's the first thing he does? He got up and was baptized. (laughs) And after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. Now Saul, a little background on him. He was a Pharisee from the tribe of Benjamin, taught by the famous teacher Gamaliel. He had some synagogue cred. In Rochester, you need street cred. Saul had synagogue cred. He could get in there. So immediately the Lord used him because, verse 20 At once, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the one who raised havoc in Jerusalem? Same Greek word that we heard last week. Havoc. The wild boar and the prey, tearing things apart. Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who who call on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and he baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving That Jesus is the Messiah. That word proven means joining together. So he was taking all those scriptures. And that's how it works. The more time we spend in scriptures, the more we know it. The more the Holy Spirit gets it in us. And the more we have it ready with the power of the Holy Spirit to put it together. When he's ready for us to use it. He was ready for Paul to use it. He was using it, proving, putting it all together that Jesus is the Messiah. Now you'll notice how in the middle of verse 19 it says, Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. 
verse 23 says, after many days had gone by. More like three years. Go to Galatians. Galatians chapter 1. Galatians is right after 2 Corinthians. So not too far from Acts. Can I get a volunteer to, to read that? If you're watching on YouTube, read Galatians chapter 1, verse 18. So I need a volunteer to read Galatians chapter 1, verse 18. John. Right after three years, I did go up to Jerusalem to visit the people and stayed in there fifteen days, but I did not see any other apostle except James, the Lord's brother. Thank you. All right there you go. He spent three years in the area, in Syria, Damascus, that area, before he went to Jerusalem. Well, one of the reasons he went to Jerusalem is because the Jews were ready to kill him. In Damascus. Why do you think the Jews wanted Saul dead? The Jews believe there is only one God. Jehovah. These Christians say in that Jesus is God. Jesus is the Son of God. That goes against their monotheistic religion. That's blasphemous. He needs to go. So verse 23, after many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him, but Saul learned of their plan. See, there had to be some kind of spy system. Or Holy Spirit revelation. Day and night, they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. Literally. That's what it means. Like, Either they dug a hole or there was a secret hole in the wall. They made a way through and loaded him in a basket and he made his escape. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. It'd be hard not to be afraid of him. I mean, I can understand Ananias questioning God. <laughs> Do you really want to get close to someone who's breathing murderous threats against you? He'll gladly hold coats while you get killed. As they say, his reputation preceded him. But guess who shows up? The son of encouragement. Verse 27. But Barnabas. Yep, the same Barnabas in Acts chapter 4. Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoke, spoken to him. And how in Damascus... He had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with him, and they moved freely, about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly 
in the name of the Lord. He talked and he debated with the Hellenistic Jews, same Jews that killed Stephen or brought him before the Sanhedrin. And guess what? They tried to kill Paul, or he was Saul at the time. When the believers heard this, they took him down to Caesarea. And guess what they did? They sent him home. They sent him to his hometown of Tarsus. Tarsus was the capital of Cilicia, or Cilicia, I mispronounced it. Cilicia. And let me tell you what I learned about Cilicia this week. It was a college town. I grew up in a college town. In fact, when I was a college student at Mount Vernon Nazarene College, Jay Leno did a bit on The Tonight Show after West Virginia University was named the number one party school in America. He said, you have to have a 3.2 blood alcohol level to go there. That was a joke. Cilicia was a university town. The th top third university in all the world. Number one was Athens. And number two was Alexandria. Alexandria is where a lot of the early church fathers of the first, second, and third century were educated. Now, it's kind of like nowadays, LSU's number one, right? And then Grove City, and then <laughs> Syracuse. So, yep, that's what they decided to do. The church, when the believers heard of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him home to Tarsus, 300 miles away. And verse 31 says this, Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. But let's not stop there tonight because we need a preview for next week. And that's what we get in the rest of Acts chapter 9. Let's look at verse 32. Remember how this chapter started? Meanwhile, it's like when you're watching your favorite TV show and you have these characters here. Peter and John were going out throughout ministering to the Samaritans. Meanwhile, Saul gets converted. Now we're back to Peter and his mission. As Peter traveled about the country, he went to visit the Lord's people who lived in Lydda. Or Lida. There he found a man named Aeneas who was paralyzed and had been bedridden for eight years. Ladies, I don't want to get too personal, but were you ever on bed rest when you were expecting? Laura was for the last month for Regan, and she was miserable. This guy's bedridden, paralyzed for eight years. I don't know. It, it's awful. I don't know if it would be worse. You read about people who are paralyzed from birth. They never knew what it was like to walk. This guy knew what it was like to walk, then became paralyzed, bedridden for eight years. Verse 34. Aeneas, Peter said to him, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and roll up your mat. Now, where have we heard that before? 
when Jesus healed the paralyzed man, when that paralyzed man's friends ripped open the roof, dropped him down. This time Peter's saying it. Get up and roll up your mat. Immediately. How many times have we seen that word in this chapter? We've seen it a bunch. Immediately, something like scales fell off Saul's eyes. Well, then we see, at once, Saul began to preach in the synagogues. Here, after Peter says, Jesus Christ heals you, get up and roll up your mat. Immediately, Aeneas got up. All those who lived in Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. In Greek, her name is Dorcas. And the fifth grade me used to laugh when I heard that. What, about, what do we know about Dorcas? She was always doing good and helping the poor. About that time, she became sick and died. And her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Lida was near Joppa. So when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lida, they sent two men to him and urged him, Please come at once. Peter went with them, and when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. All the widows stood around him, crying, showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. Peter sent them all out of the room. Then he got down on his knees and he prayed. Turning towards the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes. And seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. Then he called for the believers, especially the widows, those widows who were just with Peter, showing them, look, look at what she did for us. He called for the believers, especially the widows, and presented her to them alive. This became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. Peter stayed in Joppa for a time with a tanner named Simon. In Acts chapter 10, we'll read about what happens to Peter on Simon's rooftop. But what did you learn about discipleship from Acts chapter 9? 